Well, this is not the only tax question being considered on the November ballot. There is also state question 766, which exempts all intangible personal property from ad valorem taxes. Well, seemingly a simple question, state question 766 has widespread implications that could drain tens of millions of dollars from schools, fire and police protection and other vital state services while potentially boosting homeowners property taxes that state question 758 proponents hope to cap. Now earlier I visited with an Oklahoman with an interesting perspective on how we fund things here in Oklahoma. Mike Dix is a farmer rancher but also a school board member and an economist. Mike, when it comes to the tax debate that's going on in our, our state, how do we balance the, the, the wants on one side to have lower taxes and, and then the wants on the other side of continuing state services? Well, you know, it's, a, it's an economist's dream to have these thoughts about that because in a, in a, in a sense you're saying, okay, let's lay out what we need. And it, what, what I find interesting is no matter who, no matter what, what they're talking about, the governor, or the state legislators, it's at every meeting. It's you know we know our roads are bad. Uh, we know we need money for DHS. Our teachers are underpaid. Uh, the state workers haven't gotten a raise in I don't know how many how many years, etc. They have all these lists of problems. And then right around they'll turn around. But we're going to have a, a tax cut this year because we want to give you your money back. And and the problem with that is 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 it makes it sound like every dollar we give to the government is a waste of our money. It's, it's not a purchase of services, it's a waste of money. And, th and that's the wrong approach. You know, you have to list and say, what are, the what are the things we really need to have? If we need to have our roads fixed, how much money will it take to do that and how do we get the money? And we, we don't seem to have that argument anymore. It's, it's all about, look, we're, we have uh, this much money coming from taxes and that's too much. We have too high a taxes. Well, you know, you, you, you say you have too high a taxes, but when then you turn around and you look at the services that we're not getting, Obviously, we're not paying enough. So it's it's a. I, I think we're we, we need to step back and have a look at it and say what is it that we want to accomplish? What is it that we want government to do? And what are, and and how can they do it more efficiently on some of these things than say you and I can do it by uh, by fixing our road by hiring someone to fix it? See what I mean? So you you say the government's there because the transaction costs are are cheaper if the government does it than if we all try to collectively do it individually. See what I'm saying? So you say, that, that debate needs to go on. We don't seem to have that debate. We have two separate debates. We have a debate about needs and how to allocate what, what we've decided to, to draw from the people. And then we have this, how much should we draw from the people? But they're not connected. And they have to be connected, just like your budget at home is connected and the budget at any, any business is connected. So I, I think that's a, that, that's a major problem in, in, in this state, in the federal government, and in and a, and a lot of a lot of governments. And nearly all governments. And I believe it was Abraham Lincoln that said, and this isn't a direct quote, that government's role is to do what we can't do individually as well. Right, right. Do we risk as, uh, if we see taxes maybe lower on the state level, that those then just get transferred down to the local level? city level, the school board, school level. Is that a problem? Well, I mean, that's exactly what's been happening. It's been happening for a long time. You know, a lot of people talked about the federal government and this enormous bureaucracy and its, and its expansion and, and expenditures. But if you go and look, you'll see that in real terms, uh, the federal government's budget's been pretty flat. And unfortunately, that means that the states had to pick up the slack for all those services. And if they didn't do it, they toss it down to the municipalities and the counties. And that's what's happening. Uh, you know, I'm on the local school board, and I, and I, and I find that amazing that, that uh, I've been on 10 years now. And during that time, the number of regulations and new things that the schools are supposed to do has increased dramatically. But the amount of funding that's gone for the schools, right, has been dropping. And, and now they're talking about uh, we won't get back to 2008 levels, maybe for three or four more years. So uh, how is it that you want to have all these services provided to the students, but you don't want to give us the fund to do it. it, it it's just going to get tossed back, and, and, I, and I, can, I can talk about most of the school boards in, in Oklahoma have taken the same tact we have, is we have gone out and we've had a very supportive public here, and we've done it through bond issues. So now not only do we build buildings with bonds, but we buy school buses with bonds, we buy computer and technology equipment, we buy textbooks. Uh, we do a lot of things with bonds that we never did before. And that, the reason we do that is because we're not getting the money from the state. 
I've heard a lot of people say, well, if that one area wants to have better schools, they can do just as, as you're saying. But do we risk as an entire state and even as an entire country not being competitive in the future by not investing in the present day? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that that's the problem you risk is, sure, you know, Stillwater is an education community, so it's not a real struggle to get that, that funding from from the Stillwater community. But there's a lot of communities that don't have that, that background. And so are you gonna throw them out to the wolves and say, you know, deal with it any way you, you can, but we want you to have these test scores, otherwise we're gonna call your schools failing schools. I, I think that's just a little bit difficult on those. And it's, just, it's no different between the schools and the, and the, and the uh, police departments and the fire departments and all the public entities that are out there. It's just gonna be very difficult for them to support themselves off of totally local uh, local funds. I had a parent one time that would always tell me that I had champagne taste on a beer budget. Is that what our country has these days? Well, that's a good question. I think we need to do both of those. I, I think our wants exceed our needs, mm -hmm. and I think we're unwilling to pay for what, what our needs are. Now, Mike, there is a state question that's going to be voted on in this coming November that will lower the rise of ad valorem taxes. From your perspective as, as an economist and as a school board member and let's say as a landowner too, tell us what you think, what we need to be thinking about. The question we're gonna be voting on is whether we want to cap the growth in ad valorem, which is currently capped at 5% and lower that cap of, on growth to 3%. As I said uh, earlier, the uh, amount of bonds that a school can raise now is much more important than it was in, in the past because much more of the operating expenses of the, of, the, of the school is being paid for out of those bond funds. So we're much more dependent on our local community for overall support than we were uh, previously. And, and I, I find that interesting is that the state uh, government doesn't want to fund us to, to do those and they, they want to put it to local, but now they want to provide uh, an avenue for local people to say, uh, we don't want to do that. We, we want to put a cap on that, on that growth. And, and if they cap that growth, it's going to have an, an, an immense impact on the public schools. Uh, uh, right now, uh, uh, you're not going to see the growth in real estate values uh, that we've been seeing in the last uh, decade. Uh, and so the 3% cap probably won't be uh, taking uh, a big shot on us yet. But when things do pick up again, and that cap of 3% is on there, keep in mind that when, when property values go up by 5 or 10%, you're talking about a lot of things going up and not just those property values. And if, and if, the, and if you're not uh, able to increase your uh, uh, levy and your ability to capture that money at the same rate, uh, you're, you're going to fall behind. You're not going to be able to afford the things that you're now having. We don't have to give everybody a textbook. We can ask every parent to buy that textbook. But that's not a very good goal because we have a lot of kids in this community that are uh, from families that are impoverished. And, and that's, a that's a tough item. Uh, one of the problems we have in the public school systems is working through with those kids. Those kids do not have the same benefits as uh, some of the uh, more wealthier middle class people do. They don't get to go to camps during the summer. Uh, they're not around uh, the kind of learning environments with computers and whatnot uh, that the richer kids have. So there's a lot of things. Some of them don't participate in the extracurricular after schools because there's charges on some of those things. And so uh, those kids come in, they're a little bit behind at the beginning. And if they don't get to participate in those events that the other kids are participating, not only during school but, but outside of school, they're going to get further behind. And as funding gets cracked down, those kids are going to get further and further moved apart. And, and while that's a problem in, Oklahoma, in, in, in uh, Stillwater, it's a bigger problem in the urban areas. So, so and as you said, for the entire United States, this is an enormous problem, that we need to educate those kids. We need to bring them all up to a specific level. What we really need to do is make sure that we reach their potential. Right? Not every kid is, is going to be college bound and not every kid's going to get a PhD, but every kid has a potential and we need to make sure that each kid reaches that potential. Is investing in education investing in economic development? Uh, absolutely. Probably the best uh, thing that the state did, the uh, best economic tool uh, that, the, that the state ever did was uh, doing the, the pre-K program. Uh, starting to pay to have kids be in full-time pre-K. Uh, again, those kids that were economically disadvantaged, the quicker you can get them into school and get them the same, uh, same things that, that all the other kids have, the better off they're going to be.
And so that was an, that was an enormous investment. I mean, when you think about, even in, in our district, I think uh, uh, we're talking about uh, probably uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of three or 400 kids extra that got brought into the school. So, and that's $3,600 a kid. And you think about that across the state, that's an enormous investment. That was probably one of the best uh, economic developments the things that the state's ever done for itself. And those kids now will be better off because they got, a, they got an earlier start in education. Now you can see much more on the future of taxes in Oklahoma. Just head to the value added section on our website at okhorizon.com. There you can hear what others have to say and also join in on our ongoing conversation on Twitter. Just use the at okhorizon TV sign and join our conversation and let us know what you think.